Is there a strategy that'll help you grow your company faster? CEO Sales Strategies is an investigative business podcast for entrepreneurial people who never stop asking questions. Highly acclaimed sales revenue growth expert, Doug C. Brown, interviews CEOs, business owners, and professionals who serve them to uncover and share actionable tips and methods behind their bulletproof sales strategies. Topics covered on the show include their failures, struggles, secrets, and processes that help them succeed in selling millions to billions of dollars of their products and services, all with the sole aim of helping you grow your business. If you are eager to know the most effective sales secrets from the A players of the game, then the CEO Sales Strategies podcast is certainly the place to be. Hey, everyone. This is Doug C. Brown with the CEO Sales Strategies podcast. We've got a great guest today. His name is Mr. Steve Haru. And Steve owns a company called The Sales Collective. Uh, They're at thesalescollective.com. The reason I asked Steve to come on here is he's an expert in hiring elite performers. And all of you have been telling me, hey, I would like to have top beyond. So, you know, top performers and then elite performers. Those people are just, they don't even think about quota. Quota is like, there is no quota. We're just going to blow this out every single month. We're going to just keep growing and growing and growing and growing. How do you find these people? What do you do? How do you attract them? How do you train them? How do you retain them? How do you manage them? We're going to get into a pretty deep conversation on the front end of this whole process on how you you know find them, attract them, uh, get them to work for you. Uh, because when you have the right elite performers in selling and in sales, then what you have is you have this elite team that is going to bring a ton of money into your company, uh, but they have a process that they look for, and we're going to discuss this. We're going to also discuss what's changed, you know, now in 2022, 2023, you know, now we're in 2023. What has changed from the past few years to now and how you must adapt and change your sales uh, conversations and structure? So great interview. I think you're really going to like this. Let's go talk to Steve right now. Steve, welcome to the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, man. Great to be with another uh, New Englander. So uh, (laughs) even though we might not all be from Boston, I think I'm closer. But uh, thanks for uh, for having me, man. This should be fun. Well, I think our last uh, our last uh, interview was from California, so you're you're halfway in between, so that's cool. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so, uh, Steve, why don't you tell everybody what you do so we can set the frame for the conversation? Sure, um, love to answer this in a specific way. I uh, try to undo about ninety five percent of what people have been taught about sales and sales leadership. Uh, run an organization called the Sales Collective where we help teach, train, coach, support, consult with organizations that are tiny, that are large, that are global, that are backyard to help them be more effective in selling and leading in 2023. Uh, So much has changed for us uh, just in the past couple of years. We just can't do the stuff we did five years ago. So that's what I get to do. Love to do it. Speak, train, coach all over the country and uh, couldn't be happier. So we're going to talk about hiring elite performers today. We're going to talk about how to do it the right way. You brought something up, so I have to go down this path. What sure. what has changed from your perspective in selling from today to, I don't know, even three years ago, right? So it's a long answer. I'll give you the short answer. The short answer, the way people buy now, it. It's a, it's a lot different. Uh, buyers are more savvy. Uh, they're more educated. They can find out everything about you, your brother and your mother in about five minutes. And so what I see a lot of companies, a lot of salespeople doing is in the discovery process, You know, they're still doing the, let me tell you about my company and the features and the benefits and why we're great and all this kind of stuff. They already know all that stuff. And if they don't know it, you should be sending that in advance. So you don't have to spend the first 5, 10, 15 minutes doing discovery stuff when you can do deep questioning, deep insight, and really figuring out problems they didn't even know they had. And so that's what I think 
one big change is the second's obviously virtual selling. Um, and, and when it comes to hiring, we'll talk about this. There are still some folks, some women and men that still believe, well, I need someone in my office and they need to be local. No, they don't. 95% of the time they don't. If you run brick and mortar or you're going to plants and visits, and I, I get it, right? You have manufacturing. I, I get that. But the majority of things now today are, can be done virtually. We have virtual dentists. We have virtual doctors. We have virtual psychologists. And it's no different in sales. And so if salespeople do not adopt this virtual world and get great on Zoom or Teams or Web or whatever you use, that is a hindrance. And so I think we need to focus on being better and more effective in a virtual sense. And sometimes people say, oh, it's hard to build when you're not in person. Yeah, that's because you suck at it. This has nothing to do with the medium. So get good at this and you'll watch your results skyrocket. And I, I will second both points. Both points, it's, it's so easy to find information on people now. I mean, when I was growing up, if you went to go get an automobile, there were three dealerships usually, Ford, Chevy, Dodge. That was it, right? And then you might be in an area lucky enough to have one or two foreign car dealer at that point. So you go to the dealer, the dealer would have all the information. They know everything about the car. They know what the price of the car was. They know, you know, was it hit in an accident? They know the history of the vehicle, but we as the buyer did not. Correct. Now, wow. I mean, we just go up a few clicks of a button, maybe pay a few dollars to, I don't know, Carfax or whatever they charge, you know, um, and we'll know pretty much everything about the automobile that they don't even know sometimes. Nope. <laughs> uh, it's funny, man, the car, which is why still people today hate buying cars, which leads to why there are Carvanas and all these places you can buy online. Obviously, Tesla, people buy them sight unseen, but even still today, and this happens when I go to buy cars because I lease cars. So I'll go into the dealership and I'll know what the money factor is. I'll know what the interest rate is. I'll know all this stuff. And I go, listen, just give me these numbers. I want the money factor. I want the interest rate. And what are you going to sell me the car for? That's it. Just give me three numbers. And they still today. Yeah. You know what? Let me, uh, let me get the manager and uh, you know maybe we can meet in the middle. What do you want your payment to be? Do you understand what I'm saying? And that, again, is this old school sales mentality where they're holding the data hostage. They know they're never going to see you again, which is where all the closing BS came from, right? Just tell them whatever you want to tell them. You're never going to see them again because there were traveling salesmen who used to be across the country. They know they'd never see you. So they'd say whatever they had to say to get you to buy today. That's what all this closing garbage comes from and quotas and all these other dumb things. That's not the world we live in. And so if you don't evolve, you are going to be like the dodos, just like Mr. Darwin taught us, buy, right, survival of the fittest. And, and we love it because there's so many bad salespeople following the other bad sales trainers and gurus right off the cliff. It, it makes it 10 times easier for us who have honesty, integrity, and humility. And it's strange for prospects to understand that. And they've not seen it before. And so half the time we talk to big, you know, big, huge company CEOs and they're like, wait a second, aren't you going to like trial close me? Or uh, don't you want to do the upfront? I mean, they make a joke about it. I'm like, right. no, want to have another talk? We will. And, you know, if you don't, cool. I mean... I just thank you for your time. You know, so it's this is very odd um, that still the closing crap is is taught today. It didn't work in the eighties, let alone right now. But it's still taught. So that's the stuff we try to undo. I, I want to throw one other idea by you because I want to get your your feedback on it. I, I feel this because face to face has diminished. Right, there are still people who like to go to the golf course. Still are like sure. face to face, right? Um, but because it's diminished and because we live in such an electronic world, I find that there's a disconnection of people now. And that follow up as the third point is even more important than ever. And I'm not talking just following up on the sale. I'm talking following up in perpetuity for uh, a relationship to regenerate additional sales. 
I, ha- I see this being weaker than ever before. And part of the reason I think it's weaker, Steve, is because everything is self-service today and people are right. getting used to it. But what they don't realize is we're getting a disconnect of humanity between our, our, our buyer or our potential buyer and, and us as the selling entity. <clears throat> and I see this all the time. It's like, when's the last time you talked to your, 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 you know, your uh, client? And it's like, oh, two years ago. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> so well, they think they're talking to them, right? Doug? Because they've put in all the automation. And so they think, well, I send them a, you know, a nurture email once a month. Like they know it's not you. They know it's automated. So I like automation. It really does make a salesperson better because we forget lots of stuff and we won't send them anything. So um, handwritten thank you notes is still something we teach and and implore people to do. But then just randomly picking up the phone, randomly setting up a Zoom, randomly going by to visit your client. It doesn't matter, again, if it's in person or virtual, but they have to see you and hear your voice. You can't just put someone on a drip, right? That's not customer service. Uh, But that's what some people think is a customer service. So it's really important to make sure that your face is seen somehow, right? It could be um, a a video message, right? That you send them on LinkedIn. Uh, It could be uh, on on Facebook, right? Send a happy birthday message. It could be a video text, right? It it could be anything. Um, But they've got to see your face more than once a year and more than just the time you ask them if they want to buy more stuff from you. Uh, That's not customer service. So I think that's a really good point. And customer service really is a sales function. 100%. But so many companies, they don't get, they don't do that. It's just. No. (laughs) (laughs) We just had this talk about how much money it costs to acquire a new customer versus maintain the ones that you have. And there are a few studies on this, but it's between 10 to one and 25 to one. That's the cost to get a new one. So why would you do that when you can just treat people like they matter? And if you treat them like they matter, they'll feel appreciated and respected. And they'll willingly give you introductions, recommendations, and referrals without you having to beg for them a year down the line at the one time you call them. And it was to ask them who else they might know that would be interested. Um, but this is the stuff that's thought, right? It's this mind boggling. It's, it's archaic tin man selling. Yep. Yep. Sell by email. You know this, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. People sell by email today. Uh, hey, Doug, here's the quote. What do you mean? Here's the quote. What, is, what are you doing? Hey, let's get together. I, I put a quote together for you. I want to review it with you. You're going to have questions. Obviously, don't want to go back and forth. On email, um, I should be available, you know, next Thursday after three or, or or Friday before eleven. But nobody sells like that. They sell by email, by quote, by RFP, no conversation, and they wonder why they're not converting deals. Because because it's easier, correct? <laughs> for them, it's to automated. Do- we got a quoting software i type their name and then, <laughs> and then they get it and then i'm yeah. back you know watching uh you know raccoons blow bubbles on tiktok right um right. you 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 have to t- treat this profession like a profession and if you do you will get paid professionally um the call right before ours new client we have they maybe have i don't know 10 down maybe like 12 sales people their top salesperson makes 800 grand. Their worst one makes two, 200, 225. Um, they are professional. I mean, they onboarding never ends, training, coaching, and development all the time. They do personal one on ones with all their reps every week. They do role play all the time. It's like, this isn't rocket science. And they're killing it. And the sales guys and gals love it. Who doesn't want to be poured into, right? Who doesn't want to get better 
and become masterful. You'll never be a master. You can just try to become one, but th their environment that they've built in their culture is incredible. And surprisingly, they all start with sales DNA, right? Which is, so I'm sure we'll eventually get to our topic. But if you start with the right gals and guys, it's much easier to, to create high-end performers. But that's the key, right, to hiring and recruiting is you got to know these people are good already and not just hope they are. Well, let's, uh, let's speak in with Mr. Steve Hero. And he owns a company called The Sales Collective at thesalescollective.com. And let's go there. Let's talk about sales DNA, hiring elite performers, because a lot of people think this is really hard to do. Yes, most. <laughs> <laughs> but Most. you and I know it's not that hard to do. It's, I mean, it's not easy, but it's not that hard to do once we do what's needed or required to actually find and attract and get a, a elite performer. So let's start with sales DNA. You, you yeah. mentioned that. So sales DNA, why don't you explain what it is? Because sure. a lot of people don't understand. Sure. Um, sales DNA is a, a, an assessment, a skills-based assessment that we use that I wish I would have found this uh, 25 years ago uh, instead of two years ago. And we all know what assessments are. Um, most people's version of an assessment they think of is a personality assessment, like a DISC or a Myers-Briggs, you know, whatever, right? There's about 2,000 assessments out there. Um, the, the assessment world was founded on one principle, really trying to determine what type of personality somebody would need to fit into a school or into the military. That, that's why they were built. But you're still making an assumption, right, that this person's personality will qualify them to do well here or there. In the sales world, it's immensely destructive for a couple of reasons. The main reason is there is no sales personality. It doesn't exist. And so when you try to prove something to match something to someone that doesn't exist, clearly you're not going to find the right people. Um, the second thing is, when you look at what makes up a successful salesperson, who are the best women and men in the world? We have these false assumptions of what makes up a great salesperson because of all the crap we've been taught. Oh, they got to have a good personality. They got to be charismatic. They got to be a driver, go getter, closer, extrovert. None of those are true. The best women and men of the world aren't like that at all. Um, and if y'all want to read, I don't know if you read, uh, but uh, Daniel Pink is just the most incredible guy. And, you know, you, many of you have probably read some of his books. To sell this human power of regret is amazing. Just came out with his latest book. But Drive is such an amazing book to help you understand the science of motivation. Um, and what Daniel did was he studied you know, thousands of salespeople and found that the people that sell the most are not extroverts. They're not introverts. They're a combination of the two called ambiverts. So they have styles of both when they need to use them. But the people that sell the least are extreme extroverts. The least. So these used car guys, the ones in your face, the always be closing morons, they sell the least of a fungi on a log sells more than an in your face used car salesman. And so if we're looking at these parameters as what makes up a good salesperson, that's why 23% of sales hires end up in success. 23. So when you have a company that needs to get the sales hiring thing right, and they're investing 100, 200, 300 grand in a sales hire, you have to be sure that it's right. And so that's why we use sales DNA, because this assessment is the only one, the only one that is built to assess somebody's aptitude in selling or sales leadership. And all the questions are asked in a sales setting or in a buying setting, meaning the way you buy affects the way you sell. 
and and Dave, we both know Dave, obviously, who um, invented sales DNA with, with OMG 33 years ago, found a way to be able to identify the 21 strengths, core competencies that make up a successful salesperson. We've got 2.4 million salespeople we've tested, roughly 36,000 companies, 155 countries. And with this data, this test is 92% predictive of success. If y'all getting 92% of your sales hires right, let us know because we want to know what you're doing. Um, but the science is, is pretty extraordinary. And that's just the first piece, right? So doing a DNA test on a candidate is just the first piece. But if your organization doesn't know how to interview people, which most of them don't, you're going to mess it up. You're going to lose that amazing person because you didn't ask the right questions because the interview questions you asked are what you looked up on Google. So it's an entire process for recruiting, just like we know if companies don't have a sales process, they're just dead meat. They don't have a recruiting process. So their recruiting process is let's uh, cut and paste all our job duties. Uh, we'll put those in an ad and put it up on Indeed and we'll just wait. When you do that, and everything's about the ad, y'all, right? Which is why we help craft ads, right? You have to write a great ad. If you don't write a great ad, you get poor candidates. And if you're choosing the best of your candidate pool who aren't great, that's who you end up with. And so that just gives you a little bit of background about DNA and why we use it. And we could talk more detail about what we decipher from it, because there are things we measure that salespeople have never heard of that make the difference between an amazing salesperson and an average one. And it's never been taught. Speaking with Mr. Steve Haru, he owns a company called the salescollective.com. I, now, Steve, since we're both from Boston, I have to call you out on this because yeah. you're from Boston. You just used the word y'all. Yeah. <laughs> I live in Dallas now, so I'm picking up all these things. And when I travel and speak in the Northeast, I, I'm aware of it, but I still will say you guys. But everywhere else in the country, I can't say, hey, you guys. So <laughs> now, y'all, is much easier. It's not... <laughs> aggressive people don't get mad at me you call me yuga so it's intentional that i now say y'all or you all so so those of you who don't live in new england now you know how we talk to one another <laughs> so that's true the uh i i, I felt there's so many points that you came up with I, i'm going to try to just stay brief on this sure on on a on a personality assessment whether it was the military or the yeah. teacher, you know, we all know a brilliant doctor who has terrible bedside manner. Yes, yes. And we all know a great bedside manner doctor that is a terrible doctor or, or yep. subpar. If I understood you correctly, what yep. DNA really means is we're going to test specific skills and traits yes. that would be facing a salesperson in the field, whether they were selling or, or a buyer from a buyer's perspective yes. or selling. yes. And we're going to measure those to see in real time how they actually perform. Yes. And we're going to be able to identify whether or not they're actually able to sell or not. Yes. Under certain conditions, whether they'll use, say, technology, um, <clears throat> whether they'll, all the things that drive CEOs and owners of companies or hiring managers insane you're going to measure those yes. competencies and i think how many was it 21 or 23 21 yeah 21 there's 21 comp competencies yep. on getting rid of all those issues and this assessment now tells the person hey this person doesn't have the will to close the sell sale. yeah it's actually it's funny not that you would know but it's it's called the will to sell Okay. So, so this first piece of DNA, which is the most critical, this metric that, that Dave came up with, we measure called the will to sell. If it is not present in an existing salesperson on your team right now, or somebody you're considering giving a hundred grand to, they literally have zero chance, zero to become a top half performer. That's the data. So we know that they will never be in the top 50% of your sales team. They'll just be a live body. 
And so the will to sell is something you cannot see on a resume and you sure as heck can't see it in an interview. So it's things like desire. And the way that we measure desire is, does this person have the desire to be world class at sales? And you'll know this, if I don't have the desire to be world class at guitar, I'm not going to be world class at guitar. It's that simple. But in an interview, salespeople tell you whatever you want to hear. So they'll tell you they do. But we can show it in about five seconds. Um, commitment is the second major piece of this, which has to do with whether or not a salesperson will do what makes them uncomfortable. This is a key to success in life. Forget about sales. Right. If you're not willing to do what makes you uncomfortable, you will not ever reach your potential. And we know what are the things that make salespeople uncomfortable? Prospecting, cold calling, follow-up, CRM, doing paperwork. If you don't do those, you've got no shot at being a top performer. Um, the last one is responsibility. Responsibility is, I think, an underrated uh, value to find in someone, especially in a salesperson, because the bottom 90% of salespeople, the worst of the worst, if they don't perform, who do they blame? Well, they'll generally blame the uh, system of the ownership. That's been my 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 experience. Oh, they what else? I should say, who do they not blame? Oh, oh in the mirror. They're not looking in the mirror. <laughs> and we know it. They'll blame the manager. The, the logo's wrong. I, I need a black logo, you know. But the top 10% of women and men, when they don't perform, it's on me. And you can't see responsibility in, a, in an interview or a resume. And that's just the will to sell. That's just one piece that we know if it's not present, they've got no shot. But some of the things I think would be helpful for the audience that really nobody knows exists. One is called the need to be liked. Roughly four out of five salespeople need to be liked. And if you need to be liked by your prospect, you're dead. You will give away the farm. You will discount. You'll take on bad customers. It's, it's just not good. And it's present in four out of five salespeople. Um, being comfortable discussing money is another one. Six out of 10 salespeople are uncomfortable discussing money. Six out of 10. So when you ask dumb questions like, what's your budget, Tom? And you don't understand the value of what you're selling. If you have a negative relationship with money, because that's how you were brought up, you won't be able to have intimate discussions with strangers, prospects about money, because you were never taught how to do that. So just a couple of those things can be a major factor. And then on the buying side, we measure how people make purchasing decisions. And one of the cardinal mistakes salespeople make is they sell to prospects the way they personally buy, which is akin to cooking your loved one dinner on Valentine's Day and you make what you want. Uh, no, you make what they want. So you have to sell to people the way they buy. And if you're an impulse buyer and you make decisions like this, guess how you're going to sell? And you're going to be too aggressive and you're going to force them to make a decision they're not ready for because they don't buy like you. So that's just a tiny little piece of some of the 21 things we measure. And it's much easier to find this stuff out in an email before you ever set eyes on this person. So your interview bias doesn't kick in and you ignore it all because you like the dude. And that's why most companies hire salespeople. They like her, they like him, and they can't see any of this that would prevent a disastrous hire from happening. So that's why we use this tool. I want to kind of illustrate this buyer's bias. Yes. And, and because we have we have buyer's bias. We also have conversation bias that, that, that I've learned too. So I have a I have a, a person that I'm helping right now in a company, and they're selling. And all I did was reframe the buyer's bias and the conversation bias, and their close rate has doubled in in in, in yeah. and half, right? And and they were like, "Oh my gosh, I didn't know I had to talk to analytical minds this way, right?" Because if we measured them on a disc assessment, 
right? They'd be a high D, a high I. So what that means, folks, for those of you who don't understand that, that means they, they love to be sociable in a driver, like they're, they're going to use language patterns like a sociable driver. But if you're selling to engineers, accountants, uh, mathematicians, uh, they're not that there aren't high D's and high I's that would be measured too. However, the majority of those people are going to be very methodical. They're going to ask methodically that that's what makes them a great engineer, right? Uh, or a mathematician. If we're coming in with language patterns that we love to communicate with, but they don't understand. Uh, my wife is Polish. I uh, am from the United States. We just don't see eye to eye because of language difference, right? right? Like a word that I use, which I did last night, she looked at me with a glare. I said, no, no, what's up? Because I knew something was up because you always know, right, Steve? Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know. She, she glared at me and I said, whoa, wait a minute. What does this mean in Polish? And she told me and I'm like, whoa, 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 no, not even close to what it means in English. <laughs> and that's what I find happen in, in conversations there. So I, w- measuring these things ahead of time is so critical, especially let's say you're an engineering firm, but you hire somebody because they're likable, like you just said. I really like Don. He's a really nice guy, right? But Don can't speak engineering speak. He might understand the terms, but he doesn't understand how to communicate. Not to get into another topic, as we could talk all day on this, but when you get a chance, we'll talk more about how I teach this in terms of animal types. And so it's much easier for people to to place people first. We love animals, obviously. And I prefer animals over people a hundred times out of a hundred. But when you can help identify, right, what type of buying behaviors they have, and we put them into animal types. So uh, you were just talking about the engineers. They're the owls. Okay. They're the owls. They're the thinkers. They're the data-driven analytical people. And if you don't talk or speak in data, you lose. Even if you hate numbers, you better know the numbers. They want data and they want more of it. Compare that to, let's say, an otter. An otter are the fun ones, right? These are the life of the party. They couldn't care less about numbers, right? So the way that you sell to an otter, you have to be more gregarious. You have to talk about where you just, I just came from Vail last week. Oh, really? Man, we were up at Sugarloaf. That's how you sell to otters. Elephants are the caretakers, right? Elephants are the volunteers. Elephants are the ones that want to know what your environmental impact is going to be or what your community impact is going to be, what charities your company donates to, that type of stuff. That's how you sell to an elephant. And then the lions, these are the the go-getters, the lionesses, right? These are the people that buy on brand. These are the people that buy on price, meaning you can't sell to them as, hey, we're the low cost provider. They don't want that. They don't care. They want the premium. They want the best of the best. They get the cars with all the stuff in it that they'll barely use because they want to know what other people think about them. They want to keep up with the Joneses. And so if you do not sell in one of those four styles to one of those four types correctly, that's why your closing percentage generally average is about one out of four. Gee, what a surprise. Because we sell the way we buy. So if I'm a lion, that's my selling style. If I'm an owl, I won't shut up about the numbers. But an otter doesn't give a crap about your numbers. And you just spent 20 minutes talking about numbers. And you wonder why they didn't buy. They needed our service. Their house was on fire. And I'm selling hoses filled with water. But that's the deeper level thinking that DNA, right, can help us teach to people so they can these concepts. Well said. I love the animal uh, analogy because it's so easy to understand, uh, yeah. you know, and, and by the yeah. way, guys and gals, um, it's not an elephant or an otter or an owl won't bite you like a lion. <laughs> they'll just bite less. True. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, or they way. won't say anything and they'll keep it in. Yeah. And you'll never know. And you wonder why you lost the deal. Yeah, that, that, that would definitely be uh, 
I, I would think your caretaker type would <laughs> would definitely hold it in. Oh, they never say they they could never say no. They could never tell you this isn't going to work, right? They say, well, we'll think about it, but thank you so much, you know. But you got to know this, and it's never taught. Um, this, this is yeah. this is great. Uh, as you know, we could talk all day. Um, yeah, I, I do want to run to the interview for a second, if we if you don't mind. Yeah. Speaking with Steve Haru. Steve yep. has a company called thesalescollective.com. Uh, Steve, one of the mistakes I see with people interviewing is they don't have a structured interview. Um, how important is it to have a structured interview? And could you kind of explain what that, that means? Sure. Um, it's immensely important because if you don't follow the same structure with every uh, candidate, you, you won't be able to have the same data if you don't have them do all the same thing and see how they react to the same question or to the same assignment, you're not going to be able to get verifiable data. So part of what we do, again, is sales DNA test is, is, is first. So somebody applies, right? Then we send them, hey, thanks so much, Doug. Really appreciate it. Here's the next step in our process. Take the sales candidate questionnaire, blah, blah, blah. Candidate fills out the DNA test. When they're filling out the DNA test before we start, there's actually a welcome video that our client records that's a message to the candidate. Hey, thank you so much for taking the time to join uh, apply for our XYZ role. We really appreciate it. We know there's a lot of companies you can consider working for, but thank you for considering us. My name is Doug Brown on this. So we that's part of the application process. So that increases the percentage that people complete DNA by probably 30%. So they do the test, shows up in your inbox. You're the hiring manager. You can see it right away in five seconds. We recommend this person, right, for an interview. Maybe we call it worthy of consideration. Maybe you want to talk to this person or not recommended, which means there's very little chance this person's going to make it. So we can't tell people who to hire, but we can say with pretty much certainty, right, nine out of 10 times, this is somebody you want to talk to. The next step is to verify with that person what you saw on DNA. And so we teach the next step as a 10 minute phone screening. Okay. There's a system to it. There's a process. There's questions, but it's only 10 minutes, not 30, not 60, not 47.2, 10 minutes. And does this person seem like somebody that is affable, that has skill sets, that sounds good, that is respectful. And you'd know that in about 10 minutes, you put them into the first interview. Then we have a very structured question set, right? That should be asked of a salesperson as a candidate or a sales manager in that first interview. You can add your own things, but there are things you have got to ask that a lot of clients and companies don't ask. And so from first to second, we'll give a homework assignment to the candidate. And we know if they don't do that assignment pretty quickly, we know most of the time they're probably not as interested as they might seem. Of course, there's extenuating circumstances. Somebody's kid gets sick, somebody's wife in the hospital, we get that. But if they're not responding quickly with, thank you so much, I'll get on this, I'll get this to you by Thursday, like you said, what do you think they're gonna do with your prospects? Um, so then we teach a second interview very specifically. And then in between the second and third, we'll assign uh, another homework, uh, which, could vary between putting a deck together, doing a role play, and we will have them present to us, right, as hiring managers in the third interview, they will have to present something. They have to put it together. We give them the guidelines of what to do, but they have to put it together and we watch them present. Now, it's only 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes max. You're getting a sneak preview of what this person's going to do with your clients, customers, and prospects before you gave them a hundred grand. So if you are not running extensive hiring processes, that's why you only get it right two out of 10 times. That's the average. So I think people don't understand this mantra of hire slowly, fire quickly. Mm. But they, most companies, hire quickly and fire slowly. 
Well, that'll cost you millions of dollars. The average bad sales hire, depending on the study you look at, there's a lot of them, costs a company $1.2 million. The average one bad hire. And if you're an early stage company or a startup and you have to hire your first sales rep and you get it wrong, it might cost you your company. Sure. So that's why the power of DNA is so valuable. And it's not really what it can gain for you. It's the loss that it prevents, right? You making that bad hiring mistake is just immensely destructive in so many ways. And so we just want to help companies mitigate that mistake. And, and what you're saying makes so much sense, Steve, because let's say we were going to, I don't know, test a, a medical procedure or a medical device or we we come up with a new I don't know, whatever, study, drug, something that we need to test. If we if we create variability in the test, we'll never know where it went wrong or we'll know it went wrong there. Right. We won't know the reason why, right? So if, yep. we, if we have variability in the interview questions, then, then that means, oh, we might have missed this with this particular candidate. We hired them anyways. We find out they brushed their teeth with gasoline and, you know, light it up in front of the client, right? And, yep. and all of a sudden... You, Lost sales, bad reputation, uh, you know, lost funds. I mean, this, the list goes on. So that makes total sense to me. Uh, I'd love to ask this one question because I, I, I sure. can't imagine listeners are saying, okay, I get it. <laughs> I fully get it. Where do I find these people, though? Like, that's, to me, the hardest part. Where do I find these people that actually, like, how do I find them? So, so you got kind of... Two trains of thought on this. The first train of thought is, okay, well, we'll just hire a recruiter to find them. The, the downside, and we work with one amazing recruiter. We've only found one, but one that's really good. Recruiters are only as good as their ability to find these people because they're going to provide you with a pool of candidates that are the best pool of candidates they found. Still untested. Don't know their DNA. Right. But they're going to present those candidates to you and hope that you hire one that they doctored up their resume, which, by the way, you should not be ever using. And they coached them on how to do an interview. So most companies hire an actress or an actor. They don't hire the real person. And so companies all over the country are getting catfished Okay, in the interview process. So you can go to a recruiter because you don't know how to find them. Or what we do, because we know how to write job ads. We find candidates for our clients in all the same places you are looking. We are finding gold. You think it's a bunch of rocks. So if you do not write a proper job ad, not in the style of 1990, in the style of 2023, copywriting matters. If you do not write the proper job ad, you will not attract the candidates that you want. So all the mediums, LinkedIn, Zip, WiseHire, Indeed, we use the same mediums, the same platforms. We just know how to write the ad. And so there's a lot of that that goes into finding candidates. And that's why when you ask companies, why is it so hard to find salespeople? And they go, man, I just... There aren't very many. We don't know how to look or whatever. The tech world, and I have to thank, right, the tech world, you know, the Elons, the Bezos, Zuck, all. Thank you for running your companies inefficiently. We love it because you're flooding the market with amazing talent. There has never, ever been more talent available than there is today. And so many incredible women and men in sales they don't like where they work. That's why they're leaving, not just being voluntold to leave. They're resigning. Why? No culture, no responsibility, nothing, right? They're not recognized. They're not appreciated. So if you can write an ad in the ilk of what these people are looking for and they go, that sounds like me, that's how we attract candidates. But if you just have a job ad with we need three years of experience and you must have SaaS knowledge. What do you, what, why would someone look at that and go, I want to work there? So 
That's why the way we write the ad, the welcome video attracts more people. And I'll, I'll end on this one. We have a new client we're working with in a very bland industry that salespeople don't look for jobs in this industry. And they couldn't find a sales rep for four months, had probably 10 applications in four months, all the same mediums. We wrote their job ad. And in one month, we have 130 completed DNA tests. Um, they had like 260 or something applicants. One month. Um, doesn't mean it's going to happen every time. Doesn't mean we guarantee we'll get you 100 applicants. But more, right? More. Right. Um, but it all starts with, are you using the right tools to find the gold? Or are you just walking around on the ground going, well, there's no gold here. You know, I didn't see any. <laughs> Black belts wanted. You could either go to a karate school or JC Penny, right? You can <laughs> use the metal detector or using your eyes. And most people are using their eyes and they go up. Oh, guess, guess we got to try a new area. Yeah. Nope. It's right there, but you're not using the right tools to see it. Makes a lot of sense. Steve, uh, I know people are listening to this going, okay, all right, I get it. I, you know, I got to talk to Steve. How do they get a hold of you? How do they learn more about you? Uh, easy way, uh, gals and guys, salescollective.com. That's easy. LinkedIn, you know, or, or I'm always on LinkedIn trying to provide as much content and help as we can. So you can look me up, Steve Haru, H-E-R-O-U-X on LinkedIn. Those are typically uh, the best ways to reach out. And uh, again, I'm I'm just excited to to share, you know, some of the stuff that I've been taught. You know, most of what we teach, I had to learn from other amazing mentors, other amazing women and men um, that have helped us, you know, get to where we are. And so we're happy to share anything we can to help. And if y'all want to reach out, you know, we'd be more than happy to talk with you. Steve, thanks for being on the CEO Sales Strategies podcast. Thanks, man. Appreciate you, Doug. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Okay. I hope you have a whole page of notes. I always take notes. There's always something I learn on every podcast from every guest. Uh, so think about today's selling, right? Today, we talked about, you know, you, you got to know how to hire elite performers, right? In today's economy. And those elite performers are going to then know how to sell in today's economy. You know, virtual selling has become so much bigger than it ever has. I remember years ago, we used to teach something called take it virtual and companies loved it because they wanted to have more virtual people, but now it's standard, right? It's, it's, it's one of those things that a lot of companies are doing and a lot of people expect it, you know, face-to-face -face is still great. And if you can do it, excellent. But you know, a lot of times CEOs, business owners, decision makers, they don't really want you in their office. They'd rather do it virtually. And in fact, I read studies all the time that said, CEOs, 70 to 72% of the time, depending on the source, uh, they want to have a conversation like we're having right now, if you're watching this video. In other words, they want to have a conversation between two people like Steve and I did, and uh, then get more into the process. Now, you can take that data and do whatever you want with it. The reality is that virtual selling is here to stay. It's not going to change, especially now that people have been accepting it more and more and more. Uh, follow-up, absolutely important. Follow-up is absolutely important. And the reason behind follow-up is because it's expected as a common courtesy. But the reality is the majority of people don't do it. Or they'll do it once the sale's over. They'll send like a piece of something or, you know, they'll make one phone call. And they never talk to this person again. But follow-up needs to go through all the process, must be through the process. So when you're looking for elite performers, First and foremost, you want to write down and be very clear about what type of elite performer you're looking for. Now, it's really one of those things that, you know, I want somebody that's, you know, this particular caliber, and you want to be specific about what the job realities are. And then you want to be specific about what impedances or things you might have in the company. Can you actually support this person. I'm not talking financially. I mean, internally, if somebody comes in and they sell three times more than your average rep, let's say, can you support that type of process within your company? Because they're going to look for that type of support. So first and foremost, 
What do you really want? Be truthful. Secondly, how do you go find these people? You've got to know how to write the ad to attract these people. You know, Steve and I were talking and I was joking a little bit. You know, I see I see ads like Black Belt Wanted, right? And it's like, okay, so do you want a martial artist? Do you want somebody who's a leathersmith? Do you want somebody who can make vinyl belts? You know, what is a, uh, do you want a Six Sigma, you know, a person who handles Six Sigma Black Belt? Uh, you know, uh, it's a totally different you know, industry per se, it's a totally different offer. It's a totally different potential person. So what do you want specifically, right? You've got to write an ad around that. And Steve's a master at doing that. Then you want to have, once you attract them, understand what the DNA is before you even interview them. Why waste your time going through an interview if indeed you don't have to? Let the assessment work its magic and then it'll make a recommendation. As they said, 92% of the time, if you follow the steps that he's laying out and the other steps that he has, and you implement these 92% of the time, you are going to have a top hire and they will be in the top 10% of all your sales reps. So if you like the subject matter of this, please go and give it a five-star review. Share it with your friends. People need to know information and the more information we can put out there, the more people we can help, the better this podcast uh, has served our community. So if you yourself or someone you know is an expert in something and you want to uh, do a subject matter on that uh, or hear a subject matter on something, let us know. Reach out to us at Y-O-U-M-A-T-T-E-R, that is you matter because you do to us, at CEOSalesStrategies.com. If you want to learn how to get into the top 1% of earners in your industry through selling, or you want to understand a little more about our SaaS product that we're coming out with, uh, which is an automated prospecting and relevant and meaningful follow-up and conversion tool, please reach out to me directly at Doug at CEOSalesStrategies.com. Uh, both of these are being released this year. If you want to be on the waiting list, please let us know. I will be happy to have you here. And uh, if you have questions, reach out to me and I'll answer your questions. Until next time, go sell something today. Go make somebody happy. Sales is about fulfilling the opportunity for us to help somebody with a problem or an opportunity they're looking to seize and, and grow upon. And what more noble pursuit can we do than to help somebody achieve their dreams? Do it in a win-win fashion. That means they win, you win, okay? So if it's not right for them, you be the first to disengage. Until next time, this is Doug C. Brown with the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast saying to you, make it a great day and to your success. Thank you for listening to another episode of the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast. What is something that you learned that you could act on today? Don't forget to schedule it now or it may never get forward momentum. If you find our content valuable, please leave a favorable review and let us know what you liked. Please also share this with others if the content will help them. For our show notes, other episodes, and more interesting content and resources, please visit CEOSalesStrategiesPodcast.com. See you soon and to your continued success.